Thank you all. Welcome to the GGSA Lunch and Learn. This is the first one for fall 2021. And today, Dr. Daniel Spitzer is going to be presenting on his research, How to Start a Startup. Uh, so Dr. Spitzer is a, the founder of AMAPS Environmental Inc., a consulting firm dealing with mapping and monitoring of environmental processes using remote sensing, GIS, and hardware software developed by his company. So he is currently an adjunct professor at UOttawa and uh, the University of Windsor. And if you're interested in working with him, feel free to reach out. Okay. So Daniel, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Kathra. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, thank you also for the opportunity to give this lecture. It's my first time for lecturing online at the University of Ottawa. And um, I'm not sure what kind of lectures you had in, in the previous series, series uh, a year ago, but this might be slightly different. And won't, there won't be much of scientific content in the presentation. I will focus on how to bring the results of the scientific research and the data, measuring data into daily practice. And by daily practice, I mean how to generate products which have value for the customer, monetary value even. So as you mentioned already, um, I will be using an example for this whole process. I'll be using example of a company called AMAPS Environmental established uh, in 2004. And this company is specialized, is focused on using um, not only satellite, but let's say remote sensing, airborne and satellite remote sensing for Earth's observation um, and uh, delivering results in in this uh, area field of uh, field of expertise. So it's it's a process in three steps, and uh, it's displayed in the diagram here on the right hand side. And I will return to this diagram a few slides further to give some more information. So maybe first I could introduce the company. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's established in Ottawa. Um, it's the market of the company are the Canadian, 90% Canadian governmental organizations, federal, but also provincial and municipal, some academia, and a few industries. Industries which uh, either are in charge of monitoring environmental processes, by this, I mean mostly in, uh, in mo uh, monitoring uh, air pollution from, from industrial discharges, emissions, and uh, greenhouse gases, of course, the last uh, decade. Um, customers. Customers within the market are policymakers, decision makers, regulators, and scientists. Those who uh, use uh, results or actually the products of the company for for a daily business technology technology base what we are using is I mentioned passive remote sensing which means that the source of the radiation is uh, sun and the instrumentation we I should have mentioned it uh, remote sensing instrumentation is using um, uh, if I forget photogrammetry or photography is using uh, imaging spectrometers so for imaging spectrometer you have to really do you have to know exactly what's the spectral uh, spectrum of the of the source in our case sun uh, 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 radiation uh, of course we have to be proficient in environmental sciences in uh, environmental modeling physical and chemical modeling and algorithm gis of course and for like everywhere, we have to be good in software development. The team was three to eight uh, scientists, software developers and uh, an administrator. Um, actually, there are only three, three uh, permanent employees. The rest is being hired, hired um, from a pool of, of available personnel, depending on the project. So as I said, it was the company was established in 2004. It is not a gold mine. It makes a decent living for all of us. But as I mentioned before, I'm, it, it's a lot of fun actually. And I've been working before that. I've been working for a few large international organizations like uh, Axel Nobel, 
uh, you know, the Nobel, the, the, the guy from the dynamite, dynamite and from the, pri uh, from the Nobel Prize. And it took um, almost half of my professional life to, to switch from the large organization to smaller organizations. I, let me see. Yeah, I, I st I'm still give you some details about um, about uh, about and envir environmental. Like every organization, it has its mission: bringing satellite and uh, drone, Earth observation, science, technologies, and data into the daily practice. And it's this bringing this process is not only generating products and offering them, but it must be disseminated, it must be, the information must be distributed in user-friendly formats, because uh, the users are, like I said, often, de often decision makers, which has no close to nothing about technologies. So what you present must be easily understandable, and besides of it, it must be something they, they understand, and they uh, uh, are able to use. How do we do it? Uh, basically, there are three steps. The first is concerns the information acquisition. In our case, uh, most of the information which we which we collect comes from satellites, uh, satellite sensors, the spectral sensors of a couple of satellites. Maybe I'll give you later on some details on which sensors and which satellites we are using. What is very important is the ground truths or information data measurements which are collected at the ground level. Why? Why is this information so crucial? Because we can use it for correction of the satellite data and especially for calibration of the satellite data or the spectra. In our case, I mean remote sensing, for remote sensing we always need atmospheric information or weather information, weather and climate. So these three elements, steps are always involved in development of our products. So raw data are fed into a, into a processing unit, uh, which contains, which includes models, uh, physical, chemical transport models, radiative transfer, transfer model, geospatial uh, interpolation models. And finally, it leads to development of outputs and outputs are and I'll maybe I show more of those out outputs. But basically, what we do are the outputs are tables, of course, and especially digital maps, the digital maps which are manipulable through interfaces, through uh, applications. All right. So, um, how do we do it? As I said, the first step is the inputs. We are using currently using the Landsat satellites of NASA. Uh, satellite, uh, similar satellite from European Space Agency, and uh, the data were provided by USGS, United States Geological Service. For the atmospheric conditions, since our market is mostly Canada, for atmospheric conditions, we are using data from Environment Canada. And of course, the uh, customers often have their own sources of uh, local information, like uh, local maps, um, land use, local ground truthing, ground truthing. Modeling, uh, I mentioned it already, the geospatial interpolation uh, tech methods, which we developed uh, in cooperation with Mike Sabada from, uh, from Legis Laboratory. Our proprietary atmospheric dispersion and transport models, especially when we are dealing with air pollution and greenhouse gases emission, Oh yeah, when we are dealing with greenhouse gases emissions, we uh, need more than just dispersion and transport. We need the so-called inverse modeling because all the spectrometers of the remote sensing uh, sec sensors, they measure uh, reflectances, which are then translated into concentrations. Well, concentrations are interesting or inevitable in case if we want to know the for instance, the health effects of air pollution. But if you want, uh, if you are more interested in emission rates, like in case of the greenhouse gases, you have to use rather complex inverse models, which convert actually the concentration into the emission fluxes. 
3D models for street canyons. We had the project is the city of Ottawa for the Albert Street and Slater Street Street with high high rise uh, buildings. So for that, you really have to include 3D modeling for the for the transport of in this case of air pollution, air pollutant, air contaminants. Radiative transfer very important, which it is, may have been in the beginning of the whole list. And then if we want to uh, interpret interpret the data, the, the results into information which which the, the end user know, uh, we have to use, for instance, population health risk models. I must say that not all of the models we develop, we don't reinvent any, we try not to reinvent any wheels. So for instance, this population health risk model, model um, we got from uh, Health Canada uh, through cooperation with another institution of, uni of the University of Ottawa, the, the McLachlan uh, Institute for Population Health. Um, sorry, uh, outputs, databases, digital maps, and most importantly, the interactive software applications. This could be applications which are standalone for uh, desktops or laptops, but also web-based applications or even mobile uh, applications. So this is actually the final product because these applications with interactive uh, uh, interfaces, GUIs, allow testing different uh, scenarios. What if? What um, uh, what if um, you know the um, um, inputs change? For instance, uh, if uh, uh, the dates of the measurements do are of this uh, are not coincidental with the uh, satellite information, the remote sensing information. So you can tweak the inputs, uh, tweak or uh, adapt modeling, and then also. Um, manipulate the outputs in the formats which are desirable, most desirable. Of course, that remote sensing in general, or um, um, especially satellite remote sensing, uh, you ca can't do it uh, just alone. So you have to find a small organization, you, you have to find a big brother. In, in actually, in all, all our projects, we, in all our projects, there are cooperative projects and also funded by, um, I would call it big brothers. It's when can, funding comes, for instance, from European agency, it's not just that they give you a bag with money. Uh, they give, they have their own institutions, their own researchers, which cooperate, actively cooperate on, on, on the projects. So we cooperate with large international organizations, NASA, ESA, with large Canadian organizations, ministries, uh, and also uh, provincial ministries and municipal um, institutions. And of course, with a couple of universities, I highlighted here all the institutions which actually which in, pro in the projects also University of Ottawa was involved. So yeah, uh, find a big, big brother when you, when you want to run a small organization for each project separately, probably possibly. All right. So how to now uh, um, can after this introduction, maybe can come to to the core of the presentation, how to start a startup. Now, first question which has to be asked is why? Why would I want to uh, leave the, the safe environment of large companies and start something with uncertain future and uncertain income? Why should I do it? Well, the most important reason would be that uh, you would have identified a market, you have identified customers, which is actually waiting, waiting for your results. They don't have it. It's called the market pool. So when there is a market pool, great. So then you have to ask yourself three questions. And it, actually you have to know three no's. What is exactly the market in our uh, in our situation? Oh, sorry, in our situation, the market 
uh, the geolocation was I mentioned it is is mostly Canadians in Canadian governmental institutions and you have to also know how accessible how easily accessible is this market do I have the right networks or do I have to develop the right neck networks and um, that's the first no which has to be known before starting a company the same holds actually for the customers uh, you have to know, uh, even personally, you have to know the customers, the potential customers, and you have to know what are their needs. So often there is a tool, there is a kind of uh, uh, interviewing tool, which is called user needs assessment. And you go to potential users, you interview them and, and, and distribute the forms and, and collect the information and extract the, the those uh, needs and to see how you can match those needs with the products you are going to develop and of course uh, an, uh, a no-brainer if you want to run, run a, a technological uh, or scientific company you have uh, you have to know the technology and you have to know the science and uh, you know to know where uh, if the data and, and, and are available where is, is data available and uh, not five years ago, but right now. So you have to follow all the developments so in science of technology in your specific uh, area of, uh, of your business. So there is a difference between large organizations and small organizations regarding those three no's. The large organizations, they can control the markets, they can influence the customers, and they own the technology. So their approach is completely different than, uh, than dealing with a small organization. Okay, so now it's the list which I prepared based on my own experience before one would actually start, one would have to start the, the establish the organization. Very important is, <clears throat> is um, that I call, call learn from others. And by this, I mean um, active participation in uh, other smaller comparable, oh, sorry, comparable uh, businesses. So before I started Amos Environmental, I worked for a couple of years with similar organizations, small organizations, and I had to learn the ropes, especially coming from the academia and coming from, from big organizations. So this is, this is very important. Maybe people who have some small business backgrounds, even uh, like family businesses, or which they know the bookkeeping and, and, and some details. So it even that helps. Uh, I didn't have them, but uh, it's really important. Learn in the first years, learn from others. Now, of course, you have to have a team and the team must have to uh, uh, specific uh, proficiencies, knowledge, technical, scientific backgrounds, but also, and that's maybe even more important than having a technical and scientific backgrounds, having the marketing and sales skills. So you can develop the best possible, best ever technologies, but if you are not able to sell it, um, you won't have a business. And last but not least, you have to have guts to start something with a team. So I spoke with who are the customers, market size, geolocation, accessibility, needs and constraints. You have to develop a strategy how to market. Networking, 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 everyone knows it. Develop the right way of communication through, <coughs> in the old days, we uh, use mailings. Uh, now probably the best is social media, pre-COVID trade shows, some advertising, as long as it's not too expensive. So find is the best strategy for your specific business, how to reach the market. Of course, you need also some, some starting capital and there are different ways how to, how to acquire it. Uh, and uh, actually Canadian authorities, uh, they, they, they have a couple of uh, organizations which help you to find the investors and um, you can also start capital with own means. That's what we did. And uh, actually, if I'm not that I'm recommending it, but for the first year, we ran totally on our own uh, on our own savings. 
and we didn't pay each uh, us the salaries. But after a year, when, when the business started to kick in, it worked well. Uh, um, it helps to have some proprietary IP, intellectual property and technologies. It helps, it actually is it's, it's, uh, even inevitable to have the skills in, in, in coding and programming, to know the science, for instance, atmospheric sciences and uh, uh, radiative transfer sciences. Uh, one needs, of course, the working space. And again, there are several options. You can uh, rent somewhere a space. You can start from a garage. Uh, we have, we start with each of us having a home office, which would uh, now probably be the best option. And we rented uh, a meeting room. We rented it uh, from our partnering organizations somewhere downtown. Where, so in the meeting rooms, uh, we met once a week before pre-COVID, of course, and we also uh, had meetings with our customers and collaborators there. Once a week, no more. Administration, which could be pretty easy. We started with Excel spreadsheets, but there's also professional software for administration. Bookkeeping is good, pretty easy for a small company, but what you really need is a good accountant who does the taxes and can bring you considerable savings. Um, in, in your finances, in your taxes. Partnering organizations, the big brother, as I mentioned it already, network consultants. Um, it's important to know that government organizations, for instance, the provincial governments, they can provide you free business consultants. And not that the business, oh, sorry, business consultants will, will um, provide you with uh, uh, needs and ready, ready uh, projects to be uh, executed, but they, they have men, they know, they know many people, they know other organizations, they know, so their network is very important and it's for free, that's, that's, that's great. And the best is to start with low hanging fruit, low risk, risk projects. We started with a project, two projects actually, one with city of Ottawa, <coughs> where we were already pretty sure that we will find uh, funding for it. Another one with, uh, was with European Space Agency, where Canada participated in. And it was not like 100%, but we knew that the chances were great that we will get that starting funds. Okay, uh, last, that, well, sorry, once, once you know all these points, and may, may, maybe even more, uh, you should write a business plan. It's, it's actually a compilation of all these facts and, and knowledge. And then uh, go for it. So, like I said, uh, uh, this is not a general recipe, but it works for us. So let me see what's the time. Okay, so um, I have a project example, which maybe I can, yeah, I, I think I still can give an example of, of a project, one of our projects. Um, it's called, well, assessment of air pollution health impacts in relation to road traffic. It was a multi-year project, a few years, and was participated by, by a large organization. The customer was, city of order, but they were not only customers, they were also um, also partners in development, provided uh, ground level data. And um, funding came also from different organizations, from European Space Agency and from uh, uh, Federal Ministry, Natural Resources and Ontario Ministry of Environment. Um, yeah. Uh, I should have mentioned the, the goal of the project, that's what you have to do now before you start, is mapping and forecasting of air pollution impacts in user-friendly formats. I think I've explained already what, what it means. And our partners in development, partners in this project, were two institutions from the University of Ottawa, City of Ottawa, uh, University of Waterloo, and Windsor University. <coughs> Sorry. Inputs, um, specifically our inputs were, were two uh, satellite sensors, 
on one NASA satellite and uh, one Asia satellite. So they de deliver the raw data, which is to be processed using the atmospheric conditions from Environment Canada, uh, maps, local maps provided by City of Ottawa, traffic map, in, because it's, it's dealing with traffic, traffic uh, uh, emissions. Ground also City of Ottawa, but also some uh, federal measuring that data from federal measuring stations, so-called NAPS. Um, the Ministry of Environment, uh, provide, of uh, Ontario Ministry of Environment provided a measuring truck which moved from site to site. And um, of course, the Atlas of Canada, That's, those were the most important inputs, modeling the natural neighbor interpolation, radiative transfer. I don't think I should read all those models. I will provide you uh, a PDF or, or a presentation which could, which could be distributed where you can read all these details. Okay, outputs, that's maybe the most important. So what do we see here? This is a screenshot of, a, of an application. Uh, on the right hand side uh, are the, the parameters which could be input and output parameters which could be manipulated. Uh, the standard GIS manipulation, but also we can uh, change the model to modeling parameters. In the picture, it's, uh, that's downtown Ottawa. Uh, the red, the colored, colored uh, uh, roads indicate the traffic density. Uh, University of Ottawa is somewhere here in the south, the, the campus. And the specific question in this example was, City of Ottawa uh, was uh, wondering, well, they, they were planning and actually doing some uh, uh, construction work on the King Edward Avenue as this uh, black line, or two lines actually. And the question was, okay, uh, what, what, and what, what uh, impact does it have in terms of po uh, pollution, in terms of air pollution? Because the traffic, if, if you change the traffic, of course you change the emissions and you change the distribution of air pollution. But more than that, what impact does it has on population health? So that's the question. And these are the examples of the answers. Well, obviously, if you decrease the traffic, it has some um, advantages, impacts, which means uh, uh, the concentration of the pollutants decreases. So each color here, refers in the most left picture refers to change, positive change in uh, air pollution concentrations. In this case, I'm showing you the PM 2.5, which is one of the most uh, nasty air pollutants, particulate matter, small particulate matter. And uh, the concentration you have to turn it into the health impacts. And I've chosen uh, valuation in uh, health cost using the Health Canada model. So yeah, of course, if you decrease the vol traffic volumes, it, it uh, you decrease also the, the health cost, uh, potential health cost of the uh, connected with the change of the, of the traffic. And uh, this is just an example. We chose a reduction of the traffic by 20% for five days. And if you do all the calculations, it comes that you could save on $110,000. Again, this is just an example. Uh, but this is a very practical uh, case where uh, City of Ottawa used this application for, for evaluation of, uh, of the impacts of uh, traffic uh, pollution on health, uh, health issues. We did very similar. Uh, we developed a very similar application for city of Windsor, which was uh, used for evaluation of health impacts when they built a new bridge and they started to build a new bridge, you may know it. And of course, if you build a new bridge to Detroit, it changes the traffic patterns in Windsor. If you change the traffic patterns, you change the distribution of uh, air pollution. And if you change the distribution of air pollution, you change um, also uh, the health consequences, health impacts. Okay, I think I'm right on time. Great, yeah, I made it in half an hour. So there's some time for questions.
Awesome, thank you. So does anybody have any questions? Go ahead, Anna. I have, I have a question. So I'm curious just from, as an example, the, the project you just mentioned, how it got started, like how did you get the funding, who initiated it, how did the partnerships get developed, all, all those kinds of things? Yeah, well, that's that's a very plausible question. Let me see how it started. Uh, it started actually with a couple of topics which were raised by European Space Agency, who had uh, funds, who made funds available for study using uh, atmospheric satellites in relation to uh, public health. So that, that was the very beginning. And for that, we partnered with City of Ottawa and with the Ontario Ministry of the Environment and started, this was actually the first project with, with this theme, with this, with this uh, goal. And other project uh, in parallel, uh, we were developing with McLachlan Center for Population Health, who actually wanted to have the impact, the, the concentrations uh, translated into air quality health index. So together with them, we have developed a, a website. Again, a website example, which was mapping the uh, health, air quality health index across the national capital region. Um, they, this, and actually this was then continued with City of Ottawa, City of Ottawa, after they do, uh, got the first results, they're willing to invest uh, more funds in it, of course, much less than, than the European Space Agency did, and it resulted in another minor project. So there's a, at least three projects in, the, in this project cluster. and. I must say it, it started indeed, it started with the European Space Agency. Does it answer your question? Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it does. Uh, I'm, I'm often curious, you mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of different uh, organizations that you have worked with. And I'm just always curious to see how, how things get initiated. The money has to come from somewhere, right? So, um, that's, I guess, often the main question, where does the money come from and then how do you become aware of its availability and develop the team to access the, the funds? Well, that's the key. That's a key problem, as you know, yeah. of, uh, of any business and not only of business. I mean, it's any problem how to start projects is, is yeah, it's, 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 it's not easy to find funding and I don't know. It seems to me that it's more difficult now than it used to be. I don't know, is it also your experience? I, d I don't have a lot of experience <laughs> with this. Yeah, but, uh, how are your project financed? I mean, uh, do you need any external funding for your project? So? Um, well, so I have kind of, I have kind of two hats, right? As a, as a prof, we have our regular funding sources. The Canadian Space Agency has been there, yeah. <clears throat> They've been good at funding my research lately. Yes, uh, well, yeah, that's a great source indeed. Yeah. Um, but I also do, I also do run a small company and there it's, I haven't put any effort into it compared to what you have, um, which is part, part of the reason why I'm so curious about it. Um, it's my projects with that come sort of very piecemeal just through my own network, really. Yes. Yes. Any other questions, comments? Uh, yes. Yeah, sorry, Catherine. <laughs> I have a question as well. Uh, hi, hi uh, Dr. Daniel Spitzer. Uh, my name is Yulan, and I'm a student of uh, Anders, actually. Uh, we, we study satellite based uh, monitoring. I, I, I personally study satellite-based water monitoring. So this is very related. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question from a student's perspective. Um, in your opinion, how should students explore employment opportunities with uh, companies like 
like what you have uh, yeah well that's very interesting what you are saying what I, I spoke in this presentation only about air or mostly about air but water water quality and, and, and lake monitoring is another topic uh, which we are doing especially in last years but how your question okay well um we don't advertise generally. We are active when we have a project for which we need um, personnel of a student. We talk to our to to our contacts and yeah, it's networking actually. It's networking through, through professors who have a smart student or two of them. It happened also. We had a perseverant uh, postdoc, he was a postdoc who was able to find uh, funding of internships. And there are still a couple of them. There are, uh, there are uh, government organizations which can fund for a year an, an internship with a, not a great salary, but a decent salary. That happened twice in our case. So in your case, uh, I guess uh, I would stay a, a, a good student or exceptional student, then uh, your professor can recommend you if someone is looking for for an intern or an employee. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, when I'm close to graduation, I'll definitely look for a postdoc uh, opportunities, especially with uh, my own funding, that'll be more uh, advantageous. I think, thanks for the, uh, for answering my question. Thank you. I just, I just want to, as a comment, I've, one thing I've seen over the last decade is that the Canadian government is putting much more money into partnerships between academia and the private sector than they used to. You know, they, they used to fund basic research and they still do, of course, but more money now goes into uh, into partnership grants. Um, yeah. 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 So that especially as if, you know, once you've graduated, um, that's the kind of postdoc money that will be easier to find, I think, than just straight up sort of core research money. Yeah, there was always this golden triangle, academia, business and government and uh, in that's what we were taught and actually practiced to you have to find three partners in every corner of this of this golden triangle to, to start a successful project yeah very cool thank you both awesome any other questions okay great well thank you so much that You're was awesome. Welcome. Great presentation.